Welcome to the Market Call Show, where we discuss what's happening in the markets and the impact on your investments. Tune in every Thursday on Apple Podcast, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to the Market Call Podcast. Today we have Lawrence Bensdorf with us. Lawrence, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Louis. Uh, good to be here. You know, um, I I hadn't heard much about you, uh, except Tom Basil told me all about you, and I was very intrigued uh, with your story. So I did a little digging and looked at, at your at your background. You have quite an impressive journey. It looks like going from a self taught trader. Uh, it looks like you did you were not even involved with trading at all, and kind of got kind of got into it uh, serendipitously and yep. since that time you've just turned into a monster uh diving all the way in in the trading world and um i thought maybe if you wanted to give me a quick synopsis and give our audience a quick quick synopsis of your journey and how like how you got into trading and your background a little bit sure of course um so i'm dutch um uh, living in Portugal right now. And um, I started with trading um, in the beginning of 2000s. Now, at that time, I didn't know anything about trading at all. Um, I was a whitewater rafting guide and I was running my own adventure tourism company in Mexico. And um, I got a phone call from my uh, father and he had his own uh, venture capital company um, who was in big trouble, basically. And a large part of that was also the uh, stock investments uh, that they had. And it turned out that um, he didn't have the right advisors, etc. And he needed somebody um, to take care of his stuff as he was emotionally not able to deal with... Um, all the stress that um, was was heading to him and he needed somebody that he could trust as well. And we're talking here about a significant uh, amount that was very bad invested. So um, I said, OK, that's good. Um, I'll come down. And um, so I got back to the Netherlands. I took a look at everything at the books etc. And then I saw how big the mess actually was. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, okay, listen, um, it's going to take me at least a year to clean this up to make sure that for my um, parents that their pension at least would be um, kept and not completely lost. And um, a part of that was their investment portfolio as well, um, which they did with one of the normal regular banks um, in the Netherlands. And that was probably the first decision I took um, as working then for my, uh, my father was to completely liquidate the portfolio. So this was, we're talking here mm -hmm. the year 2000, um, March, April. So you remember the time? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It was exactly when the big boom started to bust. And um, so I saw that happening and stocks were going down. And that's where the risk manager for me came in. And I said, OK, this is what we have right now. Let's liquidate that. Um, basically, against the advice of the big banks because they said no lawrence because stocks were going up all time um, in the long run so you just need to sit it out etc and i basically said no we're just gonna liquidate everything but then um i saw that part of the stock trading and that's where I really got interested in it. Like, okay, this is actually something that is super fascinating because um, the way that you actually can make money in the stock market um, was for me a tremendous intellectual challenge. Mm. And that's what I was ready for as well at that time. So that was the start 
how I began my journey. Now, that took some guts to be able to just say, I'm going to sell it. You've got these people that are so-called experts telling you not to do that. But you have this intuition that that doesn't sound right to me. And well, it, doesn't it, wasn't, feel right. it, wasn't, it wasn't only intuition. It also was a matter of risk management um, with a basic principle. Okay, what we have can go down as well instead of also only up. So I said, first, let's clean things up and then mm -hmm. see what we're actually doing if it actually starts to make sense. Um, but well, it's, it was hard. Really, I, I'm sorry. This is really, really important that you did this because uh, there's been several times in my career where uh, I've done that before uh, and uh, where clean everything up, say we need to just like start, we need to tactically start over. Yep. And I learned this actually early in my career. I had a client who was uh, very sophisticated, who made millions and millions of dollars trading. And one of the things he liked the way I was picking stocks fundamentally, because I have a char charter financial analyst and I was a fundamental guy early in my career. And, um, and he was using that and trading off of my picks. What was interesting is that he made a lot more money than I did using the <laughs> same stocks that I picked. So he had this little account with me and he would have this, these big accounts of these other firms making money off of what I was giving him. Wow. <laughs> and one of the things that he told me was, is that sometimes you need to do, and this is a little crude, sometimes you need to do an enema. Aha, uh -huh, right, yeah. And you need to just start over. And he he kind of taught me that. that and and really what, what that, that, that teaching was is that it's not necessarily that you just change everything. It's more that you have to have risk management and that it's okay to sell. Uh, there's uh, there's a lot of people that are afraid to sell, and so just it's impressive to me that you did that early on with very sounds to me like very little experience at that time. Um, I was I was reading at that time um, probably five hours a day, mm. all kinds of books, etc. In the beginning, a lot about fundamental investing, but um, I read something as well. Um, that, that, that probably grabbed my attention that said like, okay, if you don't know why you're in a position, if you don't know what the purpose is to be in a certain position, then you shouldn't be in a position at all. And, and that for me was the main reason and taking a look a hundred years back to seeing what the stock market had been doing and that there could actually be bear markets as well. I said, okay, um, the risk is just too, uh, too big over here. It was hard to uh, convince my family um, mm. that they shouldn't rely anymore on the so-called experts. Um, so I needed to write like a 30 page um, report to them and yeah. convincing them they're like, listen, here you've got the statistical evidence and take a look at the 87 crash and what happened in 1929 to 1933, etc. Um, right now, it's all about preservation of capital. So we're just going to sell this stuff and um, please listen to me. Mm, Which they did. How, yes. how old were you at that time? Um, that was what, uh, 2000. So I was uh, 29. Okay, that's still pretty young to be able to make those types of decisions. Yep. And then especially when you're dealing with family, which is all the emotional things involved with family members. So very, very impressive. So uh, sorry to interrupt you in that. I just had to kind of interject a little bit because I thought that's that that good. was pretty, pretty interesting. So once you, once you got going on, on trading, what was your, you said you were self-taught. What would you say your biggest influences were at that point in your, your trading career? Um, a couple of things, because I read like 500 books or so uh, about trading. And um, I think you, you, you grab here and there a lot of things. But um, it, it, I mean, it's, it's not by coincidence that, um, that, that, that Tom talked about me, uh, because he also is one of the, the bigger influences uh, in my career. Mm. So it, it kind of started with um, his chapter in the New Market Wizards. And um, what I liked about that um, is a couple of things. 
I, at that time, was trying all kinds of strategies and I was incredibly stressed. All the time I was stressed. But I said, hey, I'm a trader. I'm supposed to be stressed. Mm. That was my belief at that time. <laughs> I mean, you see that on TV, like the fast paced world of trading and everybody is stressed and you make um, uh, $20,000, $30,000 a day and it goes up and down, etc. And that was my belief, my thought process, like, okay, this is quite normal. So I'm stressed. So mm. I read that chapter and then I read about, um, about Tom that you actually can be completely serene with your trading. That's why it's called Mr. Serenity. And I said, so, okay, this is interesting. So you actually can develop something and be completely relaxed with your trading. So that made a huge difference for me immediately in combination, of course, with the fact that everything could be automated. So that was the first part. And then it's kind of continued uh, learning more about different trading strategies, um, the trend following parts, etc., cetera, um, which was fairly uh, straightforward for me. I think for the strategies, I never had so many difficulties. Um, the mental side, um, I definitely can give credit as well to um, the late Dr. Van Tharp, um, mm -hmm. who I've learned a lot about as far as the mental side of trading. But then eventually um, it was that I moved over to a systematic, to a complete systematic approach. And um, yeah, that was a long road um, to get there by having a software, paying a lot of programmers, et cetera. And that was uh, a huge amount of work, uh, a big investment as well uh, of paying coders, et cetera. So let's break, let's, let's dissect that down a little bit. Um, so I, I, I hear what you're saying about Tom and, and uh, you know, changing your mindset, but going from, were you, were you managing mostly on a discretionary basis at that point early on when you said you were stressed? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I had and fundamental I, I, inputs. Were you looking at fundamentals? Um, I kind of looked at everything and that was the problem. So <laughs> I looked at the news. Um, I looked at fundamentals, but then I read some books about technicals as well. So I had all those things in my head trying to process mm. at the same time. And basically in your head, there were running like 50 strategies that how you could do this or that. And, uh, and that didn't work at all, of course. Mm. Yeah, so, the, so that you had conflicting ideas going on in your head, which let, leads to inaction or, or secondary second guessing yourself, which is very, I think a lot of traders get caught up in that. Where Absolutely. We, yep. And you go through that phase earlier in your career because you're trying to identify what do I believe about this, which is a big thing that, that I think you bring up in your book, which uh, is an excellent book. Uh, automated stock trading systems. I read this very, very quickly. It was not a hard read. Uh, and I have a bunch of notes all throughout here. Um, one of the things that uh, really stuck out to me is that you brought up this concept of beliefs. And I immediately thought of Van, and then I saw that you were with Van, and then I remembered your name because I read that book that you right. were in. Uh, the, red, the Red Book. Uh, remind me of the name of the book. I'm sorry. Uh, trading Beyond the Matrix. Trading beyond where the I, yeah, where I was featured in chapter number two. Yeah, yeah. So, so for listeners who don't know who uh, Van Tharp is, Van Tharp is is no longer with us, uh, but he has influenced many many traders, uh, and he has um, had a consulting business that helped people sort out how they were going to trade for themselves. And and I could tell he had an impact on you. And I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Um, in that process, when you were with him, I never got to meet him, by the way. I wanted to meet him, but I, it, it was like literally was planning on meeting him and then he passed away. Anyhow, um, tell me what was the biggest thing you learned from that process and how, what did you do with him? Did you like go see him? Did you go to 10 classes and what did you learn? 
Um, I did his uh, psychological uh, his psychological classes basically, and a lot of them I did. And um, let me see what is the, the the main thing that I got from him because it's it's a lot of things. Mm. Um, I think the main thing is at that time when I started, I thought that all my thoughts were true. I didn't know that actually I could be wrong or that I could just perceive a situation as what I thought was a reality, but somebody else could perceive it as something completely different. And that thing immediately goes back to the trading as well, where you see that you have two traders, they look at a chart, both have a different way of thinking and perceive the chart completely different. So the thought can be your thought, but it's only a perception. So that's probably in a recap, um, but there's so many other things um, that I've learned, of course, uh, besides that. Which kind of dovetails into systematic trading because that kind of delineates between a thought and then what actually happened in history had you done something at least to the best of your ability there's lots of things that can go wrong with backtesting but you try to eliminate as much as possible but but at least in some way that helps you in shaping your thinking right using absolutely yep uh and because when you have all these ideas that are theoretical because a lot of times when you start reading all these books you get all these theoretical ideas and some of them are not quantifiable and or many of them, most of them. And so you, there's no way for you to verify, did that really work? Yep. You know, um, you know, it's, even when you get into technical analysis, you have a lot of that, you know, because technical analysis can have kind of qualitative elements to it. That is, was that a cup and handle or was that a whatever? And uh, exactly. And then the whole question is how to program a cup and a handle in the right way uh or things like that and that was another way uh, and reason why i got more into the system in the complete systematic uh approach with back testing and simulations because i wanted to have at least historical proof that what i was trading actually had an edge uh because sometimes as a trader you have an idea and you look at the charts and then your eye sees what your brain actually wants to see, which is that it is a winning pattern. Now, seven out of 10 times when you program that pattern that you have in your mind, it doesn't make any money. Mm -hmm. when, when you were working with Van Tharp, did you have a lot of uh, conflicting beliefs? One of the things that he talks about, at least in his book, is this concept that you have parts as a trader. Like you have all these little parts in your mind that uh, as, as an aggressive trader, I, I, I want this, but as an investor, I want that. And as, as a father, I, I need this, you know, all these different parts. Did you find that that process or did you go through that process? And if so, did it help you? Yes, it, it, it helped me tremendously. And I think for me, the, the, the main thing that I had was a lack of confidence um, that I could actually do it because I am not um, educated um, as many people are like uh, who are working in banks, um, etc. Uh, I don't have a financial education as uh, like an economical degree or something like that. And that was for me a limiting belief mm -hmm. um, that I thought like, okay, it's going to be very hard for me to make it in the trading world because I don't have all that knowledge, etc. I think it turned out eventually that it has been very useful that I haven't been indoctrinated with, with a lot of that material. But, but having that belief that I wouldn't have been able um, to be successful in the trading world because of a lack of knowledge and turning that belief around um to a more positive belief uh, that was was incredibly useful yes 
Mm. Yeah, the, you're right. <laughs> that really struck me because I, I'm one of those guys that has all that education. I saw that, yes. <laughs> a CFA, a CMT, an MBA, all that stuff. And I, yep. I have people that come to me a lot of times and say, you know, they want to be mentored or looking for a job. And uh, they should I get a CFA is one of the biggest questions I get, or should I whatever? And I tell them no. And they yep. think, they're like, what? And and I'm like, not because I don't think it's it's useful. I, I, and, and actually, what I'll usually do is back up and say, let me ask you a question. Do you want to get a job or do you want to make money in the markets? Correct. Yes. And if they say they want to get a job, I said the CFA will help you definitely get a job. Uh, if you're trying to make money in the markets, you don't need the CFA. What it'll do is it'll give you so many different ideas. You will cloud your brain up like you're talking about. So I, I had to go through a, a, a similar process where I had to unindoctrinate myself after yep. the dot-com bubble. So uh, after the dot-com bubble, uh, you know, I was uh, prior to that, I was mostly fundamental. And uh, I, I, had, I had been studying technicals before that, way before that. But I, I had this belief that somehow the moral high ground was in fundamental analysis. Somehow right. somebody taught me that, and, or I believed that. So I went with that, but then I realized as time was going on and, and all these growth stocks were just skyrocketing through the roof and the fundamental stocks that I were buying were literally going down. Warren Buffett was going down. He went down like 50%. We were going right. down. We lost 30% of our assets under management. We were doing this fun. We had been doing great before that. Uh, and uh, But what I realized was that you needed to have uh, uh, the other element where nothing ever moves in your favor unless price moves in your favor. So if you don't have price on your side, all the fundamental analysis in the world means nothing. Uh, exactly. And, and, and all, you know, so, and in fact, uh, a certain percentage of the time, you could do all, every, try to uncover every single rock in fundamental analysis and you will get it wrong. And we can go through a lot of different examples yep. of that. So uh, what you're saying really um, helps me um, because I think, helps me kind of rem reminds me of that and reminds me of why uh, a quantitative approach is so important. So a lot of people, and I still struggle with this, by the way, a lot of people have a hard time going 100% systematic. Um, so going that direction says a lot about your journey because you had to uh, uncover a lot of different things, make a lot of mistakes. Can you tell me what are some of the mistakes that you you encountered going 100% systematic that you needed to resolve? I think mistakes, it, um, it was just a long process of, of getting a system basically right. And um, of course you get in the beginning, um, you work with a programmer, you have an idea, and then you start to optimize your code and you get to a great idea. And then uh, the classical mistake is that you optimize your first system and you optimize the heck out of it. I mean, you mm. optimize the results so much that it suddenly looks like you made over the last 20 years, you made, and I, I remember that day so good. Um, I got the code back from my programmer and I started to optimize and everything. And after a week or so, it was, I think, in two, six or two, seven. Um, after a week, I got a back tested return, 15 years, 300% um, compounded annual growth rate with a 5% drawdown. <laughs> I felt like a genius. I felt like, okay, I finally nailed it. And that is a thing that probably happens, or I know it happens, uh, because I've got students um, that, that, um, that have gone through that same issue as well, um, that people, they, they work so hard in backtesting and creating something, and then it is their own creation, which basically is just one big Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. So they curve fitted, they over parameterized, they created yes, all, but all the. Like me as well. And I literally, for um, 48 hours, I felt like a genius. And I said, okay, um, I finally know now how to do it. Then it turned out that there was a bug in the software. 
and then suddenly the results were a lot lower already, but it still looked incredibly good, of course. Um, and then there was another bug and uh, it looked even worse, etc. And so eventually you start to, to understand that um, the optimization process um, is incredibly dangerous because mm. it's, it makes you feel very good because it tells you what the past did. But the question is, how much is that of an indication of the future? And um, I think that is the classical mistake that I, uh, that I make. And it, I think in, in recap, it took me to a long time until I understood how to perceive a backtest and a simulation mm. and how to understand it and what to expect from it. Okay, so maybe unpack that a little bit. What are some of the big things that you look for when you're trying to perceive correctly a backtest? And it's different than what most people think it is. Um, there's two main questions that you need to ask yourself when you have, or even before you start a backtest. When is a system supposed to make money? And when is it supposed to lose money? Because there's not one system that will make money the whole time. So let's take an example, a simple trend following system. A simple trend following system is supposed to make money when there are big trends, period. It is supposed to lose money in sideways markets or when it goes down and it gets whipsawed, basically. Now, if you just know that by itself already, I think that is a lot more than an edge than if you look at sharp ratio, Sortino, Mar, etc. <laughs> because all those things, the computer can help you to make them look better, better, and better. But if you take a look at um, the top trend followers in the world who have a 40 or 50 year track record, um, if you see their uh, MAR, so the compounded annual growth rate divided by max drawdown, it's about 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Um, but you see many back tests where people have MARs of one or so on trend following, but it never will hold up because I always say you will have your largest drawdown in the future yeah yeah trend, yeah the ones with the mar of 0.2 uh when trend following is working they're the ones that are hitting it out of the park um and they're getting whipped around they're uh, in in the other environments and if you're getting a mar of even if you're getting you could easily get mars of 0 0.5 0 0.7 and uh but there's usually something that's off yeah, and but 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 so this leads into your whole your book. Your book expands a lot on this. Yeah. Uh, um, and and I know Van Tharp actually is was big about you know markets. Do you have a quiet market? Do you have a trending market? How do you uh, like to dissect up environments or types of markets? Like if you were to give us a, maybe your top three or four environments that you're trying to build a system to to make money in. Um, I think the easiest is um, if we're just talking about the stock market, right? I mean, uh, we're, we're not talking about a diversified uh, futures portfolio because then it gets a little bit more exciting, but also a little bit more complex, um, of course. But as far as the stock market, um, three directions, up, sideways, and down. So bull, sideways, and bear. And you can classify them as well then as volatile and non-volatile. Um, I like to keep it simple with that um, because I think the market types themselves are very easy to make money in. The hardest part is when a market type changes. Mm. So when a bull market changes into sideways and then goes to bear, and when that goes really fast, that's most likely the time where most people lose money. Yes, absolutely. Like the dot-com bubble, all those growthy names that were, you know, that exploded. Exactly. 
and it, and and you reacted later or um now i'm curious though uh, is most of what you trade and teach related to the stock market i mean that's primarily the focus in your book yes it's it's mainly i do trade futures myself as well um but what i uh, what i teach it's uh, it's it's mainly uh, on stocks and etfs as well and currently with etfs you can do a lot of things actually to diversify from the stock market uh, trading into uh, commodity etfs um, you have a bitcoin etf as well and stuff like that so you can do a lot of diversification as well Mm, very interesting. I was going to ask you that question if you traded futures too. I mean, I, I do trade futures uh, uh, because, and I've been doing it a long time, just because it is probably the best diversifier I know to the stock market. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, uh, a lot of trend followers in the futures space had a recent pretty big drawdown uh, just recently because we had a kind of a regime shift away from uh shorting bonds to a bond rally a huge bond yep. rally and a lot of a lot of uh trend followers were very very heavily boat loaded up in short positions and in that position they, they had some pretty some of them had pretty big drawdowns depending on their style and how they how they trade um but in the context of a stock portfolio you know sometimes that's the thing about managed futures sometimes it'll correlate with the stock market and sometimes it won't it's it's non-correlated it's not really uh uh like a hedge hedging mechanism sometimes it will hedge in a crisis and sometimes it won't so i completely um, agree i mean um, it is uh fairly diversified i mean you could say what has um lumber uh or live cattle or natural gas what has it to do with the stock markets but then you have those days where everything just goes the same direction and everything just goes down and that's the lockstep basically where it doesn't matter where you're in everything goes down the same way um, so it is as you say correctly it is not a hedge but it is a very good layer of diversification for your stock portfolio. Uh, so I do it with futures. I do some parts with ETFs as well. Um, I teach it most, mostly with ETFs um, because it's easier for people to understand uh, the ETFs parts, but also the position sizing with ETFs is um, a lot more efficient than what you can do if you've got a little bit of a lower portfolio uh, than what you can do with futures. I mean, if you want to trade a basket of uh, 60 world futures, um, you're going to need like at least like a probably at least a million dollar, million and a half to do some decent position sizing as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. So, so that leads most traders into probably it's better for them to to not be going into futures until they have the, the ability to do that or or to maybe buy an instrument that that does that for you and allocate a percent to it uh but if you want to get as close to that as possible then you would go to the etfs there are uh there are some out there they generally don't short some of them are they're structured so differently too yep. generally uh it's it's there's a lot of nuances to that so I, I, let's let's go back to stocks if we can a little bit because uh, most people invest in stocks. Most people think about stocks when they think about investing. And um, the biggest problem we have with bear markets is you have this, like you said, lockstep. All the correlations go to one. Everything goes down at the same time. Most investors are long only. So um, how are you, what kind of recommendations are you giving or advice you're giving to people when they don't short, like a lot of people will have been saving a long time in their IRAs or their 401ks, and they roll it over and they're like, I want to roll, I want to do this myself. And they can't short really in an IRA. So yep. what do you, what do you, with that constraint, what are you telling people to do and to get more diversification in bear markets? Diversification or a hedge? Or, or, or making money in a bear market. If, okay, if I... there we go. Yeah. Um, so you do have the inverse ETFs, but they are constructed not really in a very efficient way. But I think if you trade them uh, on a shorter term basis, 
you can definitely make money. So they move the opposite way uh, of what uh, the index basically does. So that is something that can work. Um, I think in many IRA accounts, uh, you are allowed actually to trade futures. Um, so that could work as well. Or you could do options as well if you have the skill for that. But there are limits um, as far as um, IRA accounts with that. I mean, um, many times I see uh, clients of mine that have, for example, um, they've got a million dollars and um, 600,000 is in an IRA account and 400,000 is in a non-IRA account. So what you can do then is you kind of over leverage the shorting part in your non-IRA account and the long trading part you put completely in your IRA account. So you kind of need to play a little bit and, and rebalance then between those two accounts. Um, I would prefer that probably um, if you're comfortable um, with, with the rebalancing with that above the um, um, inverse ETFs, because if you hold them too long, the inverse ETFs, they do have a downward bias um, because they're not constructed in a in a very effective um, way. The other thing is, which is not really um, a hedge, and that's why I asked it to you, uh, but it is to diversify, is basically to look for other um, ETFs that are just not correlated, like gold, oil, etc., cetera, um, which you can be long as well, but it doesn't always work. And I think the best example has been uh, 2022, um, where we've seen long stocks and long bonds, which both of them were an absolute uh, disaster, which for many um, financial advisors as well, has been a very hard time who only did the classical model of the 60-40, basically. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and you wind up in finding an optimal portfolio with co those constraints, you wind up having to have a lower return uh, because you have to have more T-bills. You have to have more cash uh, right. more often. And your opportunity set is lower uh, without shorting. And uh, that 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 is a, a problem, for, I think, for many investors, a real problem for many individual investors uh, from a practical standpoint. Um, and, and that leads them to probably need to do something different in how they approach it. And this is one of the things that I liked about, I, I, I think, I'm not sure if you coined the phrase or if Tom Basso co coined the idea of solving your own financial puzzle. Um, I think that's crucial for everybody. Yeah. Uh, you know, because we can talk about these concepts, but they have to be customized to you. But I really want to focus in on your book because I think your book shows that let, let's put the constraints away with all, all the, uh, accounts and all that stuff. Let's just talk about what we can do to build a good system. Uh, and and um, let's dive in a little bit, if you, you don't mind, into how you consider building a basket of non-correlated systems. How many systems should you have? What types of systems would you be considered to be the core types of systems for a good uh, balanced portfolio? So how many systems? Again, it depends on the comfort zone of uh, every individual. Every individual is different. I trade more than 50 systems uh, simultaneously, wow. and I'm very, very comfortable with that. Um, the reason I trade so many simultaneously is to lower corporate risk, basically, uh, mm -hmm. which is a big thing on stocks, of course, especially if you short them. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it, it depends. I mean, you have people that are totally happy with 10 or 12 um, non-correlated systems, but you basically can split them up in long-term trend following. Then you have long mean reversion, um, short mean reversion, and, sh and short trend following. Those are the four basic styles, I would say. I mean, you've got a lot more other styles but those you can kind of say, okay, if you've got those four, then you have um, a really good way of being covered in bull markets, in sideways markets, and in down markets. Mm -hmm. 
That's that's interesting. So the trend following and the longer term side will be slower moving, and then the is, um, is that how you're thinking not about necessarily. it? Necessarily, the the trend following um, is basically designed to make money when the markets go up. It's it's that simple. But you can be uh, in a trend following position in penny stocks, for example which will be super volatile and can move up like crazy and go down like crazy. Or you can say, well, I'd like to invest in very low volatile S&P 100 stocks uh, to be very um, low volatile, basically. So it's, 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 it's more about the direction. And then for yourself, you can decide what kind of portfolio you want to trade. But you can also then look at the uh, position sizing to say, do you want to have an aggressive position sizing or a conservative position sizing? Well, that's that brings me to some, one of the biggest um, things that I personally have found. I want to hear your opinion on this. Um, this. The type of system is one element. There's also your method for in instrument selection. What you decide to put in that system is very important. How many how many risk units do you have in each area? How correlated they are? That's a big part of it. Your time frame is also a big element, uh, and then your method of entry and exit for a given system is also a different diversification. But that has less of an impact. So, like in my experience, the hierarchy has to be what kind of system it is, what's it designed to work for. Then it would be how you. Uh, well, it's almost it's very close. It's almost it's almost as close. What you decide to put in it is big. Uh, I noticed in your book, you talk about uh, I, what if you just put a trend following system on like value oriented stocks, and then one that's more like growth oriented or more volatile. So this is like, I, it's almost like building a recipe, like building a, a, a nice meal, you know, a nice balanced meal. How would you recommend somebody approach that? First of all, I'd like to know what your hierarchy is. Is it the is it the instrument selection or is it system? What is like the most important driver of the performance of a system? For me, it's all about the um, the purpose of what the system needs to do. And I have yeah. systems that um, are designed to make money in different kind of market types. So let's put it in a simple way. I have systems that do incredibly well when the tech market is going up like crazy. I have other systems that are slower paced that are S&P 100 kind of systems. But then there's another thing as well, if we stay in the trend following space as well, there are times when a system um, Let's take a simple indicator. Um, let's use an exponential moving average. Um, somebody uses um, an exponential moving average as his trend indicator uh, to enter a position. Um, there are times when a 35-day exponential moving average is perfect. You get in quite fast, so you're very early in the ride. However, there are also times when a system like that will get whipsawed the whole time um, when its market environment is not right. So what I like is to have trend following systems that enter early, that enter medium term and that enter late. So 50 days, 75 days, 125 days, 200 days. And that gives me more of a confidence that when one or two of the systems are not working because the environment is not right for it, then there is a good chance that I've added some layers of um, diversification of other uh, systems with a different look back that might not be in the market or will not be whipsawed. Right. So you're, that's the time frame diversification. So there's Absolutely. Pur the purpose of the system you know, what is it trying to make? What environment is it trying to make money in? And then you 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 don't want to over optimize, so it's better to have time frame diversification. So if you happen to be like the the pandemic, we had a very sharp drop and a very sharp rise. Shorter term systems really kick butt, 
Exactly. Yeah. And uh, rather than the longer ones, uh, you know, so you had something that was making money during that period of time. And I know you do uh, in, uh, you know, in, in the context of mostly stock long, short, uh, you know, that's really important too. Um, I'm curious about the shorting aspect with stocks. Um, there are some challenges there in terms of like, can you get the stock and things like that? Uh, um, there's also some challenges that stocks, when they, when you're short, they tend to can move into loss territory very quickly on a big rise. They're, you know, stock drops tend to be fast and then the rises tend to be, you know, it, it, it's, it's a tougher system. It's tougher. Well, you tell me, is it tougher to build a shorting system that's got a positive expectancy or is it more just? For me, not. For me, it is. Um, I, I probably am even more bearish orientated than most people, although the stock market has um, historically a, what is it, 6 or 7% compounded annual growth rate. So there is kind of a long bias. But I started trading in April 2000. So when that in your mind, those first two and a half years of a bear market, um, that kind of stuck to me as uh, kind of a preference. And I do not say that that is the right thing, but that is just my personality. So I am very comfortable um, with bear markets. So when COVID hit, um, for me, it was just another day of trading. Um, there was nothing special for me. I knew that the short systems were kicking in and it was very comfortable and the same with 2022. Um, but it is for many people, it is hard, first of all, because they tend to compare their systems against the benchmark. Mm. So imagine you're shorting stocks and it is... Um, Let's let's do an example of my own trading. 2019, 2019, um, the S and P 500 was up, um, I think, 29 point something percent or so. My account was more or less flat, and I know that many people would have a hard time dealing with that because they see the market as a whole just moving up 30%. They see their buddies making money and say, hey, it's just so easy right now. I mean, you just buy an index fund and um, it's very easy. Then of course came <laughs> 2020 <laughs> and then COVID cash crash came, 33% drop in the S&P 500, but I was up for that time being. So, that is the first part that it's very uncomfortable for people. Um, but you need to understand that the shorting part is a protection of your capital. And um, if you're able to maybe minimize your drawdown instead of a 56%, like in 2008 of the S&P 500, uh, but you add a short selling system to it and it's only 25% of a drawdown then, um, the compounded annual growth rate that you need to make then to get back to break even is suddenly only a bit more than 30% uh, instead of that it would be more than 100%. Yeah. And what's nice about a short system too, and you're primarily involved in individual stocks, although you advise people or you give people ways to work with ETFs, but it, it, well, let me ask you this. In your opinion, do you feel like working with individual stocks, if you can, long, short, is superior to working with ETFs? Um, it's different. Um, there is more upside return, but upside return goes paired with more risk. Right. So um, I think the, the, the uh, individual, shorting the individual stocks Nine out of 10, you basically can short uh, what I have seen. If you've got a decent broker, um, there was a time in 2008 for one and a half week where I think nothing was shortable um, because the exchanges put a rule in there. Uh, but generally, they're fairly easy shortable if you've got a, 
a decent liquidity filter of 500,000 shares or a million shares or so. Um, but you need to be able to deal with the volatility of those, um, of those stocks. And especially if you have a mean reversion system where you look for very overbought stocks that you short, the moment you short them, they don't go down immediately. I mean, most likely in the beginning, you will be in losing territory. So it's incredibly important, first of all, to give those stocks some space, but also to have a stop loss in there um, so that your risk management in order so that you know what you actually could lose. But then there's another thing as well, which are the gaps. And that is something that um, I have learned through experience um, of what is it, um, 17 years of uh, live trading uh, on systematic level, um, is that you short a stock at 10 and you've got your stop loss at 12, but the day after it opens at 20, it doesn't matter where your stop loss is. No, you just lost a lot more money than you thought there was. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say, when you want to short stocks, you want to have a bunch of different systems that are all in different kind of stocks. So you lower that corporate risk. That is the main thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's, that's a really big part of the issue with, with doing that is you, your position sizing needs to be smaller and you need to have more diversification in, in doing it. Um, and, uh, the markets have an interesting way of breathing. I, I think of it as almost like breathing. When you think about the, uh, the mean reversion systems, uh, you'll go to this period of time where there'll be an excitement, higher volume, volatility moving in a certain direction. And then you mean revert and those trades will come on. The trend following will be kicking in, in the direction of that trend, but those yep. mean reversions will be taking the opposite side of those trades and, and you want to use different instruments when you do that so that they're, you're not having conflict with your trend following stuff and uh, or you're netting it. Some people like to net it, but, but when the markets kind of cools off a little bit and you, that mean reversion system tends to like make money as it's cooling off and uh, you know, that the excitement is cooling off um, and the, and the trend, if you're in a massive trend, like we saw trend followers made a lot of money last year um, in the futures markets, for you know, they made a lot of money while the market went down, the stock market went down. Yep. You know, we were in a very persistent trending mode, which you don't see very often. I mean, and when you do see that, that's when trend following really shines. You could have 50% up years. Um, you know, so you, you, that diversification is so important. Um, the, 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 the thing with the individual stocks that I think is the most challenging, you have a lot more challenges from the standpoint of accounting, you know, back testing correctly, you know, stock splits you know, not having survivorship bias issues, all of that. Uh, uh, and I saw in your book, you really outline what to look for when you're going to be doing individual stocks. And so you really talk about how you can blend these systems together. And every time you blend these systems together, you can see in your back test that you show in the book that these, these uh, return risk parameters or, or uh, results uh, get better. It was one exactly. question... That one question I wanted to ask you was, how how different have you found in your experience are your back tested results prior to a system versus your actual results um, in live trading? So, I think first thing is if you take a look at the maximum drawdown of your back test, um, two things. First thing is your largest drawdown is always in the future. And I think you should at least account for double the drawdown as what you see in your back test. If you sometimes see the structure of the drawdown, uh, let's say you have a 10% drawdown. Um, and let's say you have um, one system that risks 2% per trade. Um, it only needs five more losing trades that lose 2% and you're at a 20% drawdown basically so it's it's it can go quite fast and that is very very important um, to understand 
the compounded annual growth rate, um, I've seen two things. It is definitely lower as well in live trading. It also comes a little bit more random. So what you generally see, and that's where one needs to be, again, very careful for with um, backtesting, um, you generally see that wonderful smooth line from left low to upper right in a 45 degree angle with a perfect smooth equity curve. Um, in live trading, it goes a little bit more random. And then of course, what I say, if you trade um, more strategies, then the randomness of that effect is getting a little bit less because mm. there will always be a time where a certain strategy, uh, let's do that example again of the 35 day um, exponential moving average is not working for two or three years. And um, many people then suspend a system like that. Um, generally, there's no reason to do that. It's just a random behavior or a, a, a specific time period of the stock market that that specific algorithm is not working. But if you then have other parameters that are designed for a different kind of market structure are working, then at least you can diminish that risk a little bit. Yeah, so that that's, that's a beautiful thing when you add more of these systems and um, when you have a smaller amount of capital, is it is it important for you to be more judicious about which systems you start with? So I'm, I'm thinking about like somebody is starting out. Let's say they're starting off and they have $200,000 or $100,000. They've got to decide what systems am I going to use? I'm, I'm not going to be able to have enough money to do uh, futures uh, systems. So I'm probably going to pick stocks and ETFs. What, and and you would say you said well you're going to start off with trend following and mean reversion, and so basically you'd have four systems you split it in twenty five thousand dollars each or something like that. Yep. Uh, well, uh, is that would that be fair about how you would approach that when you're dealing with somebody who's starting out? I think you can probably trade more than that um, with a hundred thousand dollar account um, because with stocks you can do really precise position sizing. Um, you can even say like, okay, I'm not going to trade the stocks that are that are priced at three thousand dollars because then you can get an issue with the position sizing that the algorithm says, okay, you can buy 0.6 shares of this, which means you can't buy anything of it. But if you say, well, I only trade stocks between uh, one dollar and fifty dollar, for example, um, you can easily trade ten systems on the long side and 10 systems on the short side, for example. Oh, so so that's really, that's good information. So for somebody who's starting out with lower capital base, you can do this. It's not- Yeah, but you don't this. need to. I think I think what is more important in the beginning is, is what you want, what you want to achieve. What is your purpose? Do you want to capture big trends or do you want to um, wait for a pullback in a trend, then buy it. And when it reverts back to its mean, you get out. So the first thing is to ask yourself, um, where is your preference as far as trading? Because there are so many strategies out there. Um, and it, it, it really depends. I mean, I've had um, uh, clients, I've had money managers with more than $200 million under management. They said, okay, we only want trend following because our clients likes us to beat the S&P 500, et cetera. Um, but then I also have had clients that have maybe a $250,000 portfolio um, who have a complete different objective and also can trade in a complete different way, of course. So it, it all starts like what you really want um to achieve and that's that's the the main question that you need to ask yourself in the beginning you know a lot of people will just bypass that i know they'll, they'll <laughs> bypass that and say what are you talking about i just want to make money and and this brings me to something in your book that i think is like everybody should read this 
uh, your 12 ingredients of every system. Yep. I think uh, the first thing is, is what's your objective? And then you talk about beliefs and people go, beliefs? Who cares about your beliefs? I can personally tell you that that made a big difference in me because it gets your mind straight because there are a lot of beliefs that you have where it, it's not really serving you if you have a certain belief and it can conflict with another belief. And then you then you exactly. have all the anxiety, um, you know. So it, can you tell me a little bit about how you came up with these 12 ingredients? And obviously we don't want we don't want to go through the whole thing because we want people to go out and buy the book. But how how did you come up with this? And and what would you say are like the top things that people other than object objectives and beliefs? What would you say are the things that are the most important in in these ingredients? Um, how I came up with it, it was basically reverse engineering my own process, what I was doing. Um, and that was the wonderful thing of uh, writing a book when you know that thousands of people are going to write that. So you want to make sure that actually uh, it's going to be good. So I really needed to reverse engineer and think like three times deeper about my whole trading process. And then I said, okay, I've got my exits, I've got my entries, I've got my setups, um, etc. But then I said, okay, where does it all start? And it starts with the purpose. What's the objective of the system? That is that is the main thing, basically. Yeah, and you and you break that down. Like, what does that mean? Because some people when they hear purpose or objective, they really don't know, well, how do I tackle that? And you, you do break that down in the book, which I think is helpful. And um, you talk about a lot of different things that will help you build a system for yourself. So very good, very good information for people who are wanting to do it themselves or for people in the, in the business who have been more traditional in their approach with, with 60, 40, like you said, that maybe want to, uh, especially in today's environment, want to change how they do things. Um, yeah, and I can say that if you, uh, the more you think about what you want from your system, the easier it is to develop. Mm -hmm. Because if you know, I want to look for a long sustaining trend, I want low volatility stocks, um, I don't want to have huge movements and spikes up and down, etc. then you already have an idea what kind of portfolio you would like to trade. You already have an idea um, what kind of volatility levels you would like to trade with your stocks. Um, you already have an idea that you want to trail those stocks instead of taking a fast profit. So there's so many trading rules then that you immediately can cross off like this, no, I don't need no profit target, no high volatile stocks, no NASDAQ 100, etc. So um, you want to cross off as much as possible that you stay with few options. And then the whole back testing process actually is a lot easier. Um, what I've seen mostly is when, when, when people do not or, or get stuck with a system, um, the always same question from Lawrence comes then is what is the objective of the system? And then generally I hear the answer, <laughs> well, I just wanted to make money. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. When you, when you open up the account and you see your P and L on the day, you'll look at your positions and go, well, I know why that one's down today. Yeah. I know why that one's up today and, and it's doing what it should be doing. But when something is not doing what you think it should be doing, that's when you should you should have a little bit of a red flag if it's persistent. Exactly. Uh, you yeah. might have something wrong in your system, uh, uh, you know, and which is a whole other topic uh, for another day. Um, I, I really appreciate there's so much we could talk. I mean, literally, we could talk for hours. And uh, I love it. And, Absolutely. Uh, it's it's my favorite subject uh, subject to talk about. And it's. Uh, it's a pleasure, I think, to talk to somebody who knows his stuff as well like you. No, thank you. And I, I appreciate what you're doing very much because I, I think a lot of people are stuck in this world where they feel like they need to be the next Warren Buffett or something. And, and, exactly. uh, yeah. and, and what it takes to be a fundamental investor. And I think one thing that's hard for people to overcome sometimes when they think about systematic 
uh, is that you're you're not digging in deep to the balance sheets and all that stuff. You're you will have screening criteria about what you're using, but you'll use other methods to manage risk and things like that to um, kind of eliminate some of the problems uh, that you would have with high concentration in security selection. Um, you know, right. people somehow believe they need to uh, have 15 stocks of the best companies with the best quality and the best valuation and all of that. Um, and I mean, I know some really, really smart money managers that do that. And um, sometimes they make a lot of money and a lot of times they don't. And and um, it's very unusual to see somebody who's like an amazing fundamental investor that does not have massive drawdowns. Um, I don't know one of them. I mean, it's it's uh, you 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 can't avoid it. I think I think really a fundamental investor. Um, it's you can't compare it with a trader. I mean, it's it's two different things. And um, if they believe in the fundamentals, okay, um, bless them. Um, it's not something that I think is um, is 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 very sustainable um, to trade for yourself because you will go through those drops. Um, and I mean, we've seen um, 2022, which which was a 20% drop or so, NASDAQ a little bit more, uh, you had the COVID, but then 2008, 56% uh, drop. But if we go back further um, in 1929, for example, you had the crash, but the two and three years after that, um, the Dow Jones and the S&P 500 dropped to close to 90%. Um, hmm. At that time, I mean, where are you as a fundamental investor if you only have like 10% left of um, what you what you started with? Yeah, those are hard to recover from. Some people, they all say they can deal with that and they know it's part of the game, but when it happens, then they either abandon it or do something else. Um, Exactly. One thing I yeah. one thing I do think fundamental some elements of fundamentals can help a systematic trader is in universe universe selection. So like when you're going through and you're deciding what's going to be in my system, just doing some basic things saying okay, is is there something happening with this company that's going to make it potentially be acquired by another company or are yep. they in the process of things like that? You know, so so there is something to be said when you're dealing with individual securities to do some looking at what's underneath the hood. You could just say, I'm just gonna do the 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 one, the one, NASDAQ 100 or something like that, and that's fine. Um, but I personally have found it valuable uh, to be able to make some judgments about excluding some things. Um, uh, and then the other thing I was gonna ask you about was, have you ever looked at, how do you think about like earnings season and all that stuff? You just basically ignore that and say, the market will tell me what to do regardless it's just listen to the price is to that me my my process basically is i trade long and short simultaneously i trade trend following and mean reversion simultaneously i have systems that are specifically designed for markets events uh, that you rarely see so i don't care at all about the fact if it's a bull or a bear market um, I don't care if there is a season where things um, like like sell in May and and come back in <laughs> September or whatever it is. I think it's um, sell in May and uh, and go away or something. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> exactly. And um, the the point is, in that time, that all those things they are based on a buy and hold thought. And if you then say no, I trade long systematic with trailing stops and everything but also short at the same time i don't care at all what the s p 500 does i i don't look at it very often either I, I don't need to because it's it's not a benchmark for me yeah and there is a difference between shorting individual stocks at, at, at simultaneously while you're going long because you'll you could be long a lot of things and then certain stocks will be going short. You may not be using your entire risk budget on that shorting at that moment, but as the market gets more bearish, you'll you'll get more triggered shorts. Um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, if you have a system that's just beta hedging, like you're just 
you know, uh, beta hedging against the market against your holdings, which I do, by the way, I do that as well. Because uh, I think they both, they serve different functions and they don't act the same. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, the beta hedge would be like, I'm shorting the S&P 500 futures contracts against the the market volatility of my holdings at that moment. So I'm like right now I'm long the NASDAQ, but I'm also short the S&P 500. So right. it's like, yep. you know, you have these things uh, uh, and, and it makes adds to the diversification. So I think, uh, it's a different mindset. It takes a little bit of time for people to think this way. So if you want to learn more about this, guys, pick up the book. Um, I wanted to ask you, are you working on anything that's exciting you right now as we're kind of wrapping up? Anything that you want to share at all? Or um, I'm always I'm always developing new things. Um, we're working currently on, um, on intraday strategies uh, based on intraday data. Um, I think that is an additional edge as well. Um, so that is, um, it's, it's all about getting more different time frames. Um, end of day time frame, weekly time frame, uh, but also intraday time frame where you trade, for example, opening range breakouts and stuff like that. And combine that in the whole suite of trading strategies again. I mean, everything what I work on is additional to um, to what I trade already um, to find additional alpha, basically. So when I am, for example, um, let's give an example. I am 30% uh, long exposed uh, in my portfolio. So I've got some some longs and some shorts, but I'm 30% I'm, I'm long exposed um, and the market suddenly sells off. If you then have intraday, you have some breakout strategies on futures, for example, you immediately will lower the volatility of your account and you're hatched when something like that happens, for example. So that is an exciting project uh, that we uh, that we work on. And, mm -hmm. and further on, um, there's probably coming a new book uh, in 2024. Um, I can't say a lot about it yet, um, mm -hmm. but it will be more advanced uh, than this one. Um, but yeah, that's basically about it. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> you know, once you get I into the so, but it is, um, it is my passion and it is something that... I don't see it as work. Um, it's, um, I mean, I go tomorrow to um, to see my kids in um, in Spain, and uh, we're going to a beach a little bit, and I love spending time with them. But probably after a couple of days, um, I kind of get like, I want to go back oh, already and take a look, like because I get all those ideas in my head and to create uh, some more strategies, of course. So, and that's another beautiful thing about, we didn't even really touch on a beautiful thing about systematic trading is oh, that yeah. you're, do, you're doing your work, right? But then when it's time to execute, you're not thinking, you're executing, and which means you can and automate and execute quickly and then go have fun with your children. And right now you're in Portugal, uh, who knows where you'll be <laughs> a year from now. Uh, it gives you some freedom and, uh, and a lifestyle that can be opened up for many people. So, and in uh, my case, in my case, uh, my whole trading process is automated as well. So the execution part um, is automated as well. And that is very nice when you have 50 strategies. Um, you have to it, that it's point. a little bit more of a workload, of course. I mean, if you've sure. got 10, 12 strategies, you can do that manually. And it's like between 10 and 30 minutes a day and boom, you're done for the day. It's not a big deal. But when you get like to 50 or so, um, you want to have that part automated as well. And um, you can just let it run on a remote server and it just does its thing. And it sends you an email automatically if something is off. And um, that is very nice as well because you can basically psychologically detach completely from your trading process because, um, I think the development part for trading is super exciting, but the execution part is the most boring thing there is. It should be boring. 
<laughs> Your trading not, is boring. If it's not boring, then you, you something's wrong. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Then, then you know immediately if you're too excited when you're winning too much, then you know that your position sizing is probably a little bit too high. Then you're going to be very anxious when you're uh, going to lose money. Then, well, I'm looking forward to hearing about your new book when it comes out. And uh, I wanted to, ask, where could we send people to learn more about you? And we didn't even touch on your your training classes that you have. Maybe you can give just a uh, some places where people can look you up more. Sure, of course. Um, best way to go is uh, tradingmasteryschool.com. And um, over there, there's a link as well to my mentoring page. And if some people uh, are interested in that, it's a, I mentor a small group of people, generally more focused and geared on high net worth. Um, and if people are interested in that, um, they can apply and we can have a, a conversation about that. Um, it's a small group of people only. Um, I think for everybody who doesn't know me yet, the first step, if you want to know more about this, is read the two books uh, that I wrote uh, because that will help you a lot. Because for many people, it's kind of a new subject still. And um, then just go to Amazon and uh, you can buy the book. And for both books, there's a free course available um, that you can have then if you've bought the book as well. Excellent, excellent. And we'll put those links in the show notes as well. Well, Lawrence, thanks very much. We'll have to do this again sometime. I would love to. Absolutely. This was great fun. Uh, thank you. Um, it's great to, uh, to have conversations like this with uh, like-minded people like you. I uh, really enjoyed this. For the latest episode of The Market Call Show, make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Go to marketcallshow.com for all our past episodes and sign up to get alerts for new episodes. If you enjoy the content of this episode, please leave us a five-star review and comments. The information in this podcast is informational and general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision. WealthNet Investments is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where WealthNet Investments and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure.